Hey, can you hear me okay? All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, my name's Scott Spratt. I work for Baseball Info Solutions. And today, we're going to talk to you about splitting range, positioning, and throwing into separate components of Run Saved. And obviously, my voice isn't quite 100% at the moment, so if you can please bear with me for, for that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, anyway, so the defensive run save system, it's, it's the most famous defensive um, system that we, we have at Baseball Info Solutions. It's actually made up of nine different component measurements. And the foundational measurement uh, component of that is called plus minus run saved. And it relies on batted ball location and velocity data to tell you how frequently uh, fielders are able to turn batted balls into outs. Um, it credits or debits fielders based on how often those plays have been made historically by grouping similar pl uh, batted balls based on their velocities and, and locations. Let me give you a little bit of an example here that might clear that up a little bit. So let's say a ball is hit into the third base shortstop gap at about 55 miles per hour, a ground ball. Over the last three years, we can measure that and see how often shortstops have turned that ball into an out. And in this example, it's about 60% of the time. So if a shortstop makes that play right now, we're going to give him a positive credit of 1 for the play made minus the 0.6 expected out rate. That's 0.4 plays of credit that we're going to give to the shortstop. However, if the shortstop fails to make the play, we're going to give him 0 plays made minus the 0.6 expected out rate or negative 0.6 plays of credit. Because of the way that we're setting that up, it's going to naturally center. It's a major, uh, major positive uh, advantage of using the, the plus minus type of system. We're looking at the last three years, so we know that every time a play is made with .75 credit, they're going to be three plays exactly of negative .25 penalty for shortstops as well. It will always balance out no matter how hard the play is because we're using actual out rates. That's a major plus. Another plus is that this, this sort of approach easily translates into the run value. We know that if a play is made, that's the difference between having an out or potentially having a single, a double, a triple. And we can look at all of those out percentages, those hit percentages as well, to determine exactly how much run value there is. A third advantage of this type of approach is that it captures multiple facets of def defensive play. That can be range, that can be positioning, that can be throwing. All of that comes into play and it's all credited properly based on how often those balls become outs and how often they're preventing different types of hits. All major advantages. That said, there are limitations to the existing plus minus system that we wanted to address with an improved component. The major thing here is that we really want to know why it is that fielders are able to make plays or not make plays. Is it because of their range? Is it because of their throwing? Is it because of their positioning? Before, you could have a player that was really good making great throws but wasn't very rangy, and a player who was very good with range but with a, sub, uh, a below average arm, they could each have 10 plus minus runs saved, and we couldn't really tell you why it was that they had the same number. So we wanted to devise a system that could tell you specifically. Another major advantage of being able to split this up into, into separate components is that we wanted to be able to credit and debit individual fielders on defensive shifts. Obviously, this is a strategy that's come more and more in play in recent seasons. And the way the plus minus system was designed back in the mid-2000s, before defensive shifting was really a popular item, was we were looking at how often these plays were made by fielders. The Brett Laurie thing here is really the thing that sort of tipped the scale for us. Toronto was the first team to really start shifting their third baseman to the right side of the infield, and the existing plus minus system was like, hey, look, Brett Laurie just made this play over by where second baseman stands. Second, or third baseman never make these plays. He's an incredible ranging fielder. And we're like, well, that's probably not actually the case. What's happening here is positioning related. Uh, the way we've handled that until now is actually to pull those plays out of the individual credits and debits and apply them only on the team level. That actually makes some sense because obviously the teams are the ones that are deciding whether defensive shifts are going into play or not. It's not the individual player's decision. But that doesn't mean that Brett Lawry can't make a really good ranging play or frankly a really bad ranging play when he's in a defensive shift. We don't want to lose these increasing number of plays throughout the season that we can actually learn important things about a defender's ability. So we wanted a new system that could actually take those plays into account as well as the other places so we can better measure and more comprehensively measure their defensive abilities. All right, so I'm going to start doing this a little bit with a visualization that can hopefully help you. Um, here is basically what the existing range of positioning system looked like. We're modeling it with two points that we're comparing to each other. We're calling them A and D here in this diagram. A is simply the expected out ratio given a batted ball. We know it's, its velocity, we know its location on the field, so we can say how often that play has been made by a fielder in previous seasons. D is simply the play was made or the play was not made, and so D minus A gives you that existing plus minus run save number. 
What we're doing to, to get the individual positioning range and throwing credits is adding two new midpoints. A and D virtually are going to be the same. They're definitely going to be the same in nature. There are a couple of enhancements that we're adding here. But the major things are the additions of B and C. And these are basically different perspectives of the same play, different times within the play where we're going to look at that expected out ratio so we can draw comparisons. B, like A, is also going to look at the bat of all characteristics. But what it's going to add in there is the initial, the initial positioning of fielders. Um, that's something in the infield that the BIS has started tracking over the last few seasons, the starting X and Y coordinates of all the infielders when we can see them on video. And so we can use that to figure out how close they are to the ball itself. The other addition C here that we've made is going to be the expected out ratio once and if specifically the ball is fielded. And with that, we can actually look at the throwing piece of this as well. Here's how the math will basically work from sort of a, a component example. Positioning now will become B minus A. Range will become B minus C, throwing C minus D, and then you can aggregate it all together to D minus A to get range positioning and throwing runs saved. Basically perfectly analogous to the existing plus minus system, but now with that ability to actually break down the different skills that players are showing on the field and, and get out what is driving their success or problems. Let's take these one at a time. I mentioned before that the, the A step is something that we've been doing with the plus minus system for a while now, so this is probably not going to look too unfamiliar to many of you. Um, here are the major components that were the variables that we're bringing into play to make this decision. We're looking at the batted ball type. Is this ball on the ground or is this ball in the air? Um, next, we're looking at the velocity and the location of the batted ball. Um, and then finally, something that we've added for, for this new enhancement is the batter speed. Obviously, if you're a player like D. Gordon and you hit the ball to a certain place in the infield, you might actually be able to beat that out and get a single. That's something that, you know, a Miguel Montero type may not be able to do. And those can come into play, especially on ground balls. So that's something we wanted to add here as an enhancement. Uh, next up is the, the B expected out ratio. And because this is similar to A, we're looking again at the batted ball characteristics, the ball and play type the velocity, the batter speed. But the thing that we've really changed here, and you can sort of see this with the, the faint dotted lines here, is looking at where exactly those fielders are positioned. In this example here, the, the batter ball itself, the line with the arrow, is to the right side of the infield, kind of near where a second baseman would normally be positioned. But you can see the defense here is using a full Ted Williams shift, the overshift, where the shortstop is moved to the right side of the second base bag. The second baseman is a little bit out into right field, also on that side. So there are three infielders on the right side of the field. Basically, using the difference in vectors or the angles between the fielder's location and the batted ball's location, we can determine how close they are um, with their initial positioning compared to how close they would be, say, in an average defense. You know, where a shortstop's normally standing on this play, the batted ball would be something like 30 or 40 degrees to the right of him. He would never have a chance to make that play in a traditional defense. You can see here that the shortstop is only, you know, three or four different or degrees away from it. All of a sudden, this has become a fairly routine play for the shortstop. And we know that it's actually his positioning that's driving that increased likelihood of making the play, something that we can attribute to his positioning as opposed to his range or his throwing. Uh, next up, variable C. Uh, this is taking a little bit of a different approach. We're looking at this once the ball has been fielded. And given some information we have about that, we can make some estimates. Um, first, we know how far the, the fielder is from whatever th um, base he's going to be throwing the ball to, using basically the base out state, where the fielder is on the field, and the, the runner speed. We can estimate which base he's likely to throw to. In most circumstances on ground balls, this is going to actually be a throw to first base for the traditional out. But there's a runner on first base. Um, he might be looking to move to second, even potentially to get a double play. We're making that estimate based on those characteristics. Second, we can estimate the time that the fielder has left to potentially make this throw and get the out by looking at the, the amount of time it took for the fielder to actually field the ball and then comparing that to the average home to first time for the batter, something that we've been collecting at BIS for a number of years as well. We can estimate that, say, this guy goes down the line in 4.4 seconds. It took the fielder two seconds to field the ball. He has 2.2 seconds left, and we can bucket balls along those lines. All right, those are the three new critical points there that we're going to use for this system, but I wanted to talk about a complication of looking at it with this approach that we needed to address as well. Again, look on the screen. This is the same play as before where the, field, uh, the fielders are using a Ted Williams shift, three fielders on the right side of the infield. In the previous version of the plus minus system, we weren't crediting or debiting infielders at all on this. We were doing this all on the team level because it was a shift. But now that we're looking at this as well for individual fielders, we have a new problem. 
The second baseman and the shortstop are both fairly close to this ball, so it's entirely possible that this has become a routine play for both players. In the example numbers that I'm using here, we can say that the shortstop might convert this play into an out 90% of the time. The second baseman might do it 70% of the time. Well, that can be a little bit of a problem now. What are we gonna do, credit both of the players for making this play? That's actually overestimating how much success they're having from a run value saving perspective. Um, so we had to come up with a way to sort of approach that and not give either player too much credit. I mean, looking at the shortstop specifically here, he's moved a long way to increase his likelihood to make this play, but if the second baseman was gonna make it anyway, has he really accomplished anything from the team's perspective? The answer is really not that much, and we needed to come up with a way to adjust the credit that these players were getting accordingly. And so the way that we handle that is actually moving from looking at this from an individual perspective to looking at it from a team perspective. Back to that same play, you can look at the standard for that batted ball for how likely it is for the entire team's infield to make that out. And we can then compare that to how likely it is for the entire team infield to make that out, given everyone's relative um, distance away from the ball, and sort of compute that at the team level. Then we're confident then that we're getting the right amount of credit, and it just becomes a problem of divvying it up to the individual players involved. So for the positioning piece of this, we're going to be relying on that difference of the team B minus the team A, while everything else remains on the individual level. And so I've sort of adjusted our diagram here to show with the blue dash between B and A, we're looking at that from the team perspective. Range and throwing, again, still individual perspective, but now also looking at the entire thing becomes D minus team A. So again, you're shrinking the amount of total credit given based on that idea that sometimes fielders are gonna overlap and they may have made the play easier for themselves, but they may have also lost some value there in the overlap. All right, so that covers the general idea behind the methodology that we're using for this new system. So I want to go into a couple of, of result examples, some top fives from 2015. Before I do that, there are a couple of simplifications that we, we made for, for this presentation, things that we'll address in the, in the actual model. But first of all, for these results, we're looking only at ground balls. Um, this is only for infielders, only for ground balls. Uh, obviously, even infielders have to deal with air balls from time to time, line drives and pop flies. We're just excluding this for now. Um, second, we're applying a flat 0.75 run value for the hit out difference for all of these plays. That is more or less the difference between a single and an out in context neutral situations. Um, and for a lot of balls in the infield, that's pretty much the case. If you hit a ball towards where the shortstop normally stands and it gets to the infield, it's going to be a single 99% of the time. However, some of the shots down the line have a chance to become doubles, an increasing chance, so we're actually going to be underestimating the extremes for third baseman and first baseman to a, to a um, small extent here. All right, so let's start with looking at shortstops. We have all of these tables split out. You might not be able to, to see the headers too clearly, but we have the fielder, um, we have his positioning run save credit, his range run save credit, throwing run save credit, and then the combination of all three, range positioning and throwing run saved here. Uh, shortstops in 2015 are probably the most inter interesting example of this. Angels and Simmons has long been considered the best defensive shortstop in the game. And what's really interesting about this is if you look at his range and his throwing numbers, six and 10 runs saved respectively last year, he is the strongest shortstop based on those two skills. However, when you start incorporating positioning into this, that's somewhere that Simmons specifically struggles with minus five runs saved. And it's no wonder the Braves actually used fewer defensive shifts than any other team in baseball last year. Compare him to Didi Gregorius on the Yankees. The Yankees used the third most offensive shifts in baseball last year, and Gregorius got 11 runs saved due to his positioning. That's a 16-run swing or more than a win and a half due to differences in their positioning. And now that isn't all necessarily due to shifts, but I think it's pretty easy to draw a line there, and it's something that we'll come back to in a, in a little bit here. So basically, that positioning swing between Simmons and Gregorius has made them more or less equal players in terms of total run value for the Yankees and, and the Braves, despite the fact that based on range and throwing, the two major skills you would associate with a fielder, um, Gregorius is more or less an, an average shortstop, and Simmons is definitely the best. Uh, other players on the shortstop list show a sort of similar trend here. Um, we have a Danny Hechevari of the Marlins, another team that, that doesn't shift very often with negative positioning credit. You have Francisco Lindor of the Indians, a shift-heavy team, positive four positioning credit. And it's kind of bringing them closer together when in, if you were looking specifically at the range and throwing skills, there might be a little bit more separation. Another point of interest here is that Lindor, again, only played half a season for the Indians last year. This shows pretty tremendous potential over the course of a full season. 
All right, moving on to second base. You're seeing something really similar here, I think, to what we saw with Gregorius at Among Shortstops. Jose Altuve plays for the Astros, Logan Forsythe for the Tampa Bay Rays. Those two teams shifted the second and the most times among any teams in baseball last year. And these two players are getting six and seven positioning run save versus a credit. While guys like Ian Kinsler of the Tigers, Colton Wong of the Cardinals, teams that don't shift very often, they're down with zero positioning credit. And those things can, can obviously really add up. Another really interesting point here, I think, with Altuve specifically, is that he's below average with negative six range runs saved, but an incredible plus 14 throwing runs saved. Uh, that's definitely the most among second basemen, and I think one of the most um, among any players that, that we're looking at in the infield here. All right, moving on to third base. Maybe a little bit less interesting. It's very similar to what we've been seeing with all the traditional fielding metrics, which is that Nolan Arenado and Manny Machado are both really good. One potentially interesting thing this is illustrating, too, is that, say, Manny Machado plays on the Orioles, who are another heavy shifting team. Um, what we've noticed overall in our research of this is that shifting is definitely a net positive effect on positioning credit for teams. But sometimes individual players within the infield, some of them are going to benefit tremendously, like a Gregorius, while others maybe not so much. And it can depend on what, what teams are deciding about moving players where. So it, it can definitely be an issue for individual players crediting whether or not they're the player that are benefiting the most from shifting. Another benefit here, you can see Kyle Seeger with nine throwing runs saved. I think that is the most among third basemen. And that actually makes a lot of sense too. That's a number that sort of increased our confidence in these results. Seeger over the last few years has had the fewest defensive misplays in throwing related errors among third basemen. Just an extremely accurate thrower of the ball to first base. And you're seeing that reflected here. And, and yeah, that's helpful. All right, among first basemen, again, some usual suspects here like Adrian Gonzalez, Paul Goldschmidt, guys that have been leading in defensive metrics over the recent seasons. Um, one interesting thing that I'll point out with first basemen is that we're using the term throwing run saved across the board, but that can actually be a bit of a misnomer. We're basically looking at how much has the, the first baseman benefited after fielding the ball. And so for first baseman specifically, sometimes first baseman are going to run to the bag themselves rather than toss the ball to the, the pitcher fielding at. So in, in this case, this could be a combination of both throwing and that athletic move to get to the bag before the fielder, before the runner does. All right, among pitchers, um, for both pitchers and catchers, because they're obviously going to be starting from the same positioning on every play, they're going to receive zero positioning and, and um, credit or penalty. And basically, that's just the way the system was naturally set up, of course. Um, but you can still see, especially with pitchers, there can be a lot of variance on the positive or negative side um, based on just their range and throwing skills. Dallas Keuchel exemplifies that with five range and three rowing uh, throwing runs saved last year, or eight total runs saved. That's a lot for, for a position, so it, it shows that pitchers can have a lot of impact with their defense. With catchers, it's actually not the case. Um, the spread basically went from negative one to one, so there are just not really a lot of opportunities for catchers to, to field balls. You need basically really softly hit, swinging bunt type of plays. And keep in mind that bunts aren't included. We're only looking at ground balls here. Bunts are, are captured by another facet of runs saved overall. So uh, these numbers just showing the catchers have a pretty small run impact here. All right, so now looking at the top five from a, a team perspective, um, you can see that the Giants, Astros, Cubs, Royals, and Indians were the top five teams in, in total range throwing and positioning run save last year, and they kind of did it in different ways. You can see the Indians were the team that benefited the most from positioning run save with 21. The other guys are actually a net negative overall there. And what's super interesting I'm going to flip to the next slide to show you here. This is teams positioning run saved only in shifts. You can see that the Indians are on both lists here, but here the Indians have just six positioning runs saved on shifts and 21 overall. This shows you that shifting isn't the only thing that's determining how much positioning credit teams and individuals are getting, um, although it does have a lot to do with it. But there are subtle differences you can make for specific bad ball tendencies that don't involve that huge overshift in play that can be important here. However, if you just look at the positioning run save totals in shifts and there's the teams that have shifted the most last year, you can see that there's a lot of names that they have in common. The Rays had the most positioning run saved while in shift last year. They also had the most total shifts. The, the Rockies were third on both lists. The Yankees were fourth on one and fifth on the other. And when we ran a correlation to the total number of shifts that teams had and the positioning run saved that they had on shifts, we had a fairly strong 0.61 um, R squared value. So it shows that shifting drives a lot of the positioning run saved credit that individuals and teams are getting. 
Whereas if you just look at year-to-year -year correlations of positioning, it's much lower than the other components here. I think that shows you a lot of teams are, are buying into shifting and increasing their shifting from season to season. There's not that consistency for year to year for how individual fielders are being used, especially not in recent seasons as shifting has become more and more popular. So basically, there's not a huge amount of consistency with positioning for individual players. It's the team's decision to shift that's driving those values. Both range and throwing are showing pretty strong correlations, though. Um, we were doing this just from 2013 to 2015. 2013 is the first year we can calculate this using some of the positioning data that we have access to only back to that point. Um, and I used a pretty th small threshold here of only 100 um, innings required in both seasons for these. So um, that's, that's the bulk of it there. Before I finish up, I want to thank Ben Jedlovec and Joe Rosales and, um, from Baseball Info Solutions. I know Ben spent at least as much time as I did working on this. Um, and like everything else that we're doing at BIS, it's really been a team effort. Definitely check out Joe's presentation tomorrow on injury information and some of the, the metrics that we can derive from that. Thanks to John Dewan as well and everyone else at BIS. See, I was going a little bit later, but I think I can go with maybe five minutes of questions now, if that suits. You know, yeah. Hey. Right. Uh, that's, I mean, that's definitely true. I think that's sort of to a certain extent what you were seeing with the Indians when they had basically 20 positioning runs saved credit overall, but only six on shifts. Are those the guys that are doing the really strong advanced scouting work, maybe switching for the batter handedness, maybe switching just for specific tendencies of certain batters. I mean, we've definitely seen that some batters pull the ball much more heavily or maybe go to certain spots on the infield and that maybe they can make subtle defensive changes, like you said, to account for that. Uh, we have the ability to basically look at that both in shifts, out of shifts, combined, and sort of see which teams and which players are making the best adjustments in those respects. Well, say that again? Um, we can calculate this back to 2013 um, for both individuals and teams. Um, so I think that's something that we'll have is some historical data on. And then obviously we'll have it going forward as well. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the major potentials of this research is that certain teams could look to acquire players that have been suboptimally positioned in previous seasons, maybe acquire them, and even without any improvements in their actual skills, could reap big run benefits by positioning them better. I think Altuve is also a really interesting example because you noticed that his throwing run save numbers were extremely high. And some of the resistance some teams and players have had towards defensive shifting is that it puts fielders at, in, play, in places on the field that they're not used to making throws. And if Altuve is just particularly good at making throws from unusual spots on the field, that could be a really important skill to have for a team that's using a lot of defensive positioning. So an important distinction here is that the numbers that you're showing on the slides aren't reflecting a player's skills so much as the value is actually adding. Meaning a fielder with, uh, who's fielding behind a pitcher who reaches a lot of ground balls, if he's above average, he's going to have a higher number here because he has more opportunities. Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, yes, you're right. So if, if, like, let's say that two equal players, one played 500 innings and the other played 1,000 innings last year, you would expect the 1,000 inning player to have twice as many runs saved. So have Obviously, you thought about, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, this is something that we can look at on a rate basis as well, if you want to just compare sort of an apples to apples baseline. Do you think doing a rate basis would be the best way to compare players on an equal, on a level playing field, so to speak? Uh, yeah, I think it does make a lot of sense. A lot of the defensive projection work we do does calculate that using both a regression and using sort of a rate basis to compare players along a similar baseline. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that, that really sort of assuages our concerns there is that let's say it's a really hot shot to third base and he fields it. 
he's probably going to have three to three and a half seconds to make that play. So there's really low risk that even by hesitating, by double clutching, et cetera, he's going to affect the likelihood of him making the play. Um, so it's really just the ability to make an accurate throw that will be driving that in, in the majority of cases when he has a long window to make the play. All right, everyone, I, I appreciate you uh, taking the time. Thanks so much.